uh, uh, well, this is the title of my <laughs> my third book, and I'm and I'm I'm talking about it today. Uh, and um, um, I don't think I think I'll just talk about it. I'm really happy to be with you guys. Um, Hokey Oji goes way, way, way back for me because I'm an I'm an old guy <laughs> and I've been practicing for a lot lot of years. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to kind of talk from my book without getting much into it at all. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll read a two or three quotes from it, and uh, I also want to pay attention to the time. So I don't go on for too long. Let's see. Uh, I was going to ask Dokai, but I see he left. Um, I wonder how long I. What should I, Dokai? What should I pay attention to in regard to time? Um, I think. Sorry, I left. I was going to turn out the light in back of me. But... No problem. Okay. Um, no, we usually go for. Oh, I don't know. However, you're comfortable for thirty minutes. You know, whatever forty. And then okay. usually we save a little time for for a discussion. And then we like to try to end by 1030. So. Okay, that's cool. Okay. Okay, so the th theme of my book, uh, as I just said, is uh, uh, that, that opening up to a wonderful spaciousness in which really involves dying to the small self. Now, we need a small self, but in order to open up, we need to die to ourself. So that means enlightenment is an accident. There's nothing that we can do to make it happen, unless you want to take a uh, psychedelic or something, <laughs> which is a whole other story. Um, I'm not going to get into that today. <laughs> uh, but it's an accident. But these, by practicing... At any moment, we can just sort of let go of everything we know, everything we believe in, anything. And it comes up when we're practicing, but if we're soliciting it, we can't get it because it's unsolicited. It just happens. And we can make ourselves accident prone by, by practice. And my book has three sections to it. Um, I've got the, I talk about the settling in phase. Uh, which is finding a teacher. Um, the best teachers help us, help us. They help us see through the limitations of this, this self-image, this persona, and all these images that we carry around. They help us do that. And um, I talk about my early teachers. And actually, I mentioned Katagiri Roshi, too, who was a teacher of mine but not one of my early ones, um, uh, and how they helped me uh, not be caught and see through the limitations of my persona, of what I want to project to people. I'm always worried. The little, the little guy inside is always worried about what he or she is going to uh, project on others, how others are going to feel about them, and then we worry ourselves about, am I coming off the way I should come off? Why am I coming off this way? Why I shouldn't come off? Why did that happen? Why did I do that? So we're caught by this image, and we can't really just delight in just being. So uh, uh, that's the first phase, the settling in phase. Um, and uh, I I call I I uh, read from the poetry of Basho, the haiku poet, year after year, a monkey's face wears a monkey's mask. So we wear this mask because we're scared. We, we're always caught by a mask. And it's a, it's a question of seeing the mask and beginning to breathe through it and not be caught by it anymore. Um, I can't do anything about that phone. Excuse me, my wife will answer it. <laughs> Uh, so the best teachers, and Katagiri Roshi was one of the best, and my other two teachers, Suzuki Roshi and Tol Lan, my Jap Chinese teacher whom I talk about in the book, were among the best too. Um, and of course, that's just my judgment. Uh, they emphasize both a path that we're on and coming back to just practicing. 
right now, right here, just being present, just being alive, doing the practice wherever we are, completely engaging ourselves in the practice. Um, and uh, uh, Wei Nang says, if you reflect on your own true face, be underneath your image, then you open up. Then you open up. So my teachers uh, emphasize both a path to get from here to there, or we could say there to here, and and just being really present each moment. So both the line, the linear line, and the dots, and the dots. And once years ago, when I was planning on going to Japan, and I lived in San Francisco, um, I had all these ideas about where I would go to practice, because I wanted a place where they had lots of meditation and didn't have too much tourist stuff or ritual stuff, but I could really meditate, meditate, meditate. Um, and uh, uh, my teacher uh, and I were having breakfast, and uh, he pointed to the Raku pottery on the shelf next to us, Raku teak cups. Raku teacups are teacups that are done in Japan traditionally, although Americans are doing them now too. And the flaws are baked in. The cracks are baked in. The overflow is baked in. So each is different and each has its own beauty. And I was telling him about where I was going, where I was, what I was searching for. And I was really caught by, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do the other? And he said, and some of you may remember this story because I've told it many times. And I think it's in my one of my other books. I don't know. <laughs> uh, he said, he said, if you try to find the best cup, you will never appreciate any of it. Uh, and that's all he said. That's all he said. And of course, so then I ended up not going to Japan at all and just staying with him. We're always looking for the best cup. We get caught by trying to be different and be somewhere instead of just coming back to appreciating this cup as flawed as it is, just, just taking care of it and appreciating it. And so my teacher would rail against uh, step ladders and my first teacher. That's where we're trying to, where we forget just being here and we're always trying to get to the next level. But he didn't rail against me when I wanted to do this Japan thing. He just did this very subtle thing, which I don't think he even planned. <laughs> the best teaching is not even planned. It just comes out. So the best teachers emphasize both, both, both being on a path, an aspiration, an inmost request, and and being present now, doing the practice now, whatever the meditative practice is, or just being here. It doesn't have to be a meditative practice. It's just being here instead of being somewhere else. How much of our lives do we spend being somewhere else? Let's just be here. It's, it's pretty good. It's not always pretty good. Sometimes it's wonderful. Sometimes it's awful. But if we're here with it, it's, our, it's not awful. It's just not, even though it may seem awful, it's not awful. So to do this, we have to be careful, I say in my book, about spiritual bypassing, bypassing the broken places, bypassing the cracks, bypassing the vulnerable places. Those are tools to make us active or prone. And uh, Instead, honoring our commitment to deep seeing, vidya in Sanskrit, the opposite of avidya, deep ignorance. And I say in my book, many spiritual and religious organizations completely ignore the darker elements, the fear of body, which buries these negative emotions deep inside of us, the shadow self, repressed ideas, instincts, impulses, weaknesses, desires, perversions, traumatic memories, embarrassing fears, and a myriad of small and large humiliations, whatever we don't want to admit, admit to having. So our practice has to include a commitment to feeling the suffering and pain of ourselves and others with kind attention and compassion, rather than walling off these parts of ourselves that we don't like. 
well, that's part one of the book. Well, no one, we've got our, we've established our practice. We've got our practice established. We've settled into it. We're maybe not completely settled, but we're settled in. We made the commitment. And now the next phase I call in my book, stumbling toward enlightenment. But actually, I mean, that's kind of clever, but don't be so clever. It's the hard work phase. <laughs> it's the hard work phase. <laughs> And I talk about, I have a chapter on each of each of five different ways in which we do hard work as, as Zen Buddhist practitioners. Five different tools that we use to do our hard work. Our hard work to just to bring us back here, just to be present here, just to feel a wonderful interconnection here. Uh, and they are um, uh, five hindrances as portals. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, each of them. Five hindrances in Buddhism as portals into opening. Uh, uh, the five aggregates also as portals into opening. Mantras, gatas, and malas uh, used to, to help us uh, uh, prepare for this wonderful accident of enlightenment. Seated meditation, the fourth one, and immersion in nature, the fifth one. Um, Immersion in nature. Oh, well, I, I, yeah, I'm going to do it at the end. Although I do want to say, before <laughs> I do it, that when we uh, found Hokioji, my friend Paul Johnson, then called Paul Courtney, arranged a big trip for us. He'd done, he'd done, a, uh, he'd done a lot of kind of talking with realtors and. And he and so we spent a day with Katagiri Roshi in the lead, <laughs> visiting different places. And we visited actually. Well, I, no, I I better not talk about that. I can't get through my book. <laughs> anyway, when 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 Katagiri Roshi saw what's now Hokioji, he said, "Oh, uh, my heart feels something." My heart feels something wonderful when I look at the trees and the sky and the big ridge. Uh, uh. So that's nature. That's the fifth one, which I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> Being in nature is really a wonderful uh, help to. Oh, maybe I better I better talk about that one first because I'm only talking about it. <laughs> um, so being in nature. When I was a kid, uh, I spent a lot of time in nature because my father took us up into the Sierra Nevadas. I grew up in California uh, every uh, summer, every um, summer. And there was a guy named John Muir, M-U-I-R, who, who basically charted the whole Sierras and was kind of a mystic himself. He didn't know anything about meditation. He was the best kind of mystic. And, and my dad always carried the little John Muir book with him and we went, when we went hiking. Uh, and here's John Muir. <clears throat> I talk about this in my book in one chapter. Between any two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. Between any two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. Isn't that wonderful? Because nature shows us how, how we're all connected. And if we just look at a, one pine tree, we see all the life in us. And our heart, our heart is just moved by it. And then we see two pine trees and we have a whole new way of life. So nature helps us. A monk asked his teacher in Chan, China, where do I enter the path? That teacher said, do you hear the sound of the stream? Yes. Enter there. <laughs> nature, nature. Going back to the very beginning of Chan, not in India. Not in Indian Buddhism, in Chan and Zen. <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful. Wildness, the wildness of nature, where you give up your maps. I mean, we love the John Muir book, but eventually we have to just give up our maps and just enjoy being present. D.T. Suzuki calls this divine wildness. That's not my Suzuki, that's the older one divine wildness. Dogen calls us to fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the mountains. To fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the swamps. The swamps, yeah, the swamps are going to come up. They're going to come in. 
and you know you may want to avoid them, but they'll, they'll, they have, they're your wonderful teacher. All life is included in them. I know you'll get your feet wet and you get cold, and especially at my age, I don't like to get my feet wet, but the swamps are there. The swamps are part of nature. Part of nature. They, 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 they uh, are full of rich algae and, and water that, that causes us to thrive. To fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the mountains. To fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the swamps. There are mountains hidden in mountains. There are mountains hidden in swamps, says Doga. <laughs> so uh, that's that's nature. That's nature. Letting go of the map. Letting go of the map. The map that we have in our head. Just always we have a map. In so that's fine, but nature shows us how to do it. So you guys who live at Hokioji, you don't have to do as much zazen, maybe, unless you get all habituated to kind of your routines. Then you need to reverse your routines. <laughs> because as if you're habituated, you know, I used to live in the country. I lived in northern Minnesota for five years. People get so habituated, they don't notice the beauty around. They don't notice. that Their heart doesn't open. But that's what we do. That's why we... That's why we have these these portals into into uh, the accident of enlightenment. The first portal that I talk about in my book is the five hindrances: craving and greed, restless and worry, lethargy and boredom, doubt, anger, aversion, and hatred. So usually we want to get away from those hindrances, which we learn about in Buddhism, but we need to connect. We need to connect. Let's say uh, I'm feeling angry. Can I feel the anger? Can I recognize how it intensifies? What thoughts and sensations come up? And just trace it. Just be with it. Oh, and then it becomes a portal into great stillness, into great openness if we don't judge it, if I don't evaluate it. I just am with it. Just am with it. So that's the first portal I talk about uh, in the hard work phase of stumbling toward enlightenment. The second one is bringing the aggregates into view. These are the five aggregates that get dissed every morning in the Heart Sutra. <laughs> I've been dissing these every morning in the Heart Sutra for, well, you guys, you know, I'm 80 now. I started chanting the Heart Sutra when I was 20. <laughs> 60 years I've been dissing them. But I also have been teaching the last 10 years. Uh, it's fine to diss them, but also that we diss them because we get caught on them. I, I don't, I'm not going to talk about the Heart Sutra today. We, but they're important. And in early Buddhism, bringing the aggregates into view was very, very important. And uh, merit, modern Theravada teachers do it too. So the, fi the five aggregates are contact. I'm making contact with my computer now. Um, uh, the first aggregate, feeling, uh, I, I'm feeling the bottom of my computer, it feels nice and warm, so I have a positive feeling. Uh, my laptop, oh, it feels warm. Um, uh, then I have a perception, warmth, and then I have an impulse, oh, I want to keep my hands on the computer, well, because it's nice and warm, and it's a little chilly in this room. <laughs> And then I, the fifth one is consciousness. Consciousness says, well, why didn't you wear a, uh, a sweater this morning? Oh, we shouldn't wear a sweater. It's summer. Well, why didn't you at least close the windows? Uh, and tomorrow you'll close the windows when you have to give more Dharma talks. You should remember that by now. This has been going on for, you've been in this house for years and years, and you haven't learned anything yet. God, you are really stupid. That's consciousness. Consciousness takes over the whole deal so the immediacy of being of being with contact of being with with feeling of being with perception of being with impulse uh, is, is just run over by consciousness <laughs> so bringing the aggregates into view doesn't kick consciousness out it just doesn't let it be a bully anymore and that's part of our practice 
don't let consciousness be a bully by bringing the aggregates into view. That's a real an ancient and wonderful practice. Uh, so, um, oh, that practice is, I also call that practice in my book, uh, skin shedding. Uh, the Naga, the serpent who protected Buddha, uh, and and uh, the serpent who Nagarjuna is named out after. Nagarjuna is a serpent hero. He's an expert at he, she, they. They are an expert at skin shedding, at skin shedding. Because we have all these layers to protect us, because we're scared, because we've been hurt. Because as we get older, we get more and more layers. But through our practice, we can just shed layers, so that even though we get older, in our heart mind, we're we are not aging at all. We're just not aging at all in our heart mind. Uh, so we shed layers. We shed skins. That's Nagarjuna, the the philosopher king of early Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, tells us about this. And uh, I say in my book, each time we shed a skin, even though we're taking a risk, we are, because that skin protects us. We feel more alive. Shedding beliefs and memories that have given us comfort and security in a time of confusion or loss. But we shouldn't rip them off. Oh, I want to get enlightened. I'm going to rip my skins off. No, they'll just shed on their own. If you do the practice, with sincerity, they just shed. They just shed. Um, and you have to have that that shraddha, that trust in the in, in the process. And it happens, it happens, but not in your time. That's why it's an accident. You don't, it's not in your time. It's in some time that we don't even know. <laughs> we don't even know. We don't need to know. Katagiri used to just say, kick your mind out of it. Kick your mind out of it, he said. <laughs> you can't figure it out. Kick your mind out of it. <laughs> and I had that image of kicking my mind out of it. It didn't help much, but <laughs> but it was it was it it was an endearing phrase, anyone. <laughs> so that's the uh, aggregates bringing the aggregates into view as a second practice. The third practice I talk about in the book is mantras, gatas, and malas. A mantra, something that we repeat, like the uh, like the gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate in the Heart Sutra. Uh, a gata uh, is something that we repeat to support ourselves. When uh, a gata is something we repeat, also only it's situationally related. I don't know if you guys do this at Hokioji, but we used to at MZMC have gatas, one in the kitchen, one in the bathroom, one in the place where you hung your coat, one in the place all over the room. They're situ all over the building. They're situational. They'll help you in your in the situation you're in and the venue you're in. Not get caught by your thinking and just be present. Just be present. I, I talked at Zen Center about this the other day, and they said, oh, there's still one at Zen Center. And I said, where is it? And they said, I just hadn't seen it. They said, oh, it's by the mirror for shaving. I thought, wow, that's weird. Nobody shaves at Zen Center anymore. And that's where we've got a gata still from the old days. <laughs> Dokai, you must remember when we had all those gatas, right? <clears throat> so anyway... Uh, and malas, you know, are the prayer beads, uh, uh, which uh, Zen Buddhists actually do use, but are which are much more uh, prevalent in Tibetan Buddhism and uh, very, very prevalent in Tibetan Buddhism. When I went to Bhutan, which is primarily a Tibetan Buddhist country, uh, the monks and nuns, 108 prayer beads, all had them wrapped around their wrists and were working them as they meditated, meaning that's something tactile to help you bring yourself back when your mind's wandering. They were just working. And they call it working the prayer beads. And as you work them, you repeat your mantra. So they, they're they coupled with mantras. On, and uh, yes, I can talk more about that, but I want to just get through as much of this book as I can. <clears throat> uh, so 
Uh, sometimes we need to narrow our attention. Shikantaza or bear awareness is too much. We're just overwhelmed. So the mantra will help us narrow our attention or the gata. And we won't be flooded. If we're being flooded by thinking or emotion, the gata, the mantra, really helps us. Um, so I never thought we anybody did mantras in Zen. And then one day, let's see, I've been practicing with my teacher for three and a half years. I was a Tassahara, and it was the last, the next to last day of a seven-day sashin, which was arduous then and still is, is still arduous. <laughs> and uh, I was having a hard time, and my mind, I was just so trying to get my mind just to settle down so I could open up to the pos potential of an accident of enlightenment. <laughs> but it was just trotting all over. It was just galloping, galloping. But I was bringing it back, bringing it back. But it was just galloping. I bring it back. And I, I was perspiring so much that my shirt was really wet. And uh, I went into Doksan with my teacher, Suzuki. And he said, you've been swimming in the ocean. <laughs> Go change your shirt and then come back and see me. <laughs> so I went and changed my shirt, <laughs> came back to see him. He said, you've been having a very hard time. I said, boy, are you intuitive? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I mean, he could obviously really tell I was having a hard time. <laughs> boy, are you intuitive? People think I'm intuitive, but I just pay attention. That's why I'm not very intuitive. <laughs> I just mostly paying attention. Well, maybe I'm a little bit intuitive. <laughs> uh, anyway, he said, you're having such a hard time. I want you to repeat this mantra. And I said, mantra? <laughs> you know, this is Zen. I didn't say that. <laughs> he said, yes, uh, the Heart Sutra mantra. Gate, gate, para, gate, para, some gate. And I said, oh, okay. He said, this will help you. You, uh, this will help you just repeat it and i said well, when do i repeat it he said always for the rest of the retreat always and i said always he said yes always if you repeat it always <clears throat> it will be quite wonderful and i said should i repeat one lot one gate or the whole thing he said oh repeat the whole thing but one line is the same as the whole thing <laughs> So there's a teaching within one within all right the dot on the line so i did it and it and it, it helped me a lot it helped me a lot prepare for a wonderful action um and uh when i had lyme's disease which i had uh, i said i used the past tense hopefully because i haven't had a, an bout for about two and a half years uh, when I had Lyme's disease and I was really laid up here in Minneapolis, you know, still guiding teacher at Minnesota Zen Meditation Center, but not really being able to be a good guiding teacher, just kind of stubbornly sticking to what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I would, uh, and I was in bed a lot of, all the whole time, actually. I, 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 as long as a month I could spend in bed or I could go downstairs and eat and then go back. Anyway, I developed a habit of driving to the lake. Then it was, it's four blocks from our house. Then it was Lake Calhoun. And I didn't walk because it was too hard for me to walk. I would drive to the lake and I developed my own little gata. And my own little gata was uh, looking at Calhoun, seeing my still nature, heart, mind at peace. And then I shortened that to looking seeing peace and every day i would drive to the lake i did this for probably two weeks and it was a wonderful wonderful that i could do that and that i had that gata so gata you can use from the formal tradition but you can also create your own so the fourth uh, uh portal um the fourth uh phase of preparing ourselves for this for enlightenment is seated meditation but i'm not going to talk much about seated meditation um for obvious reasons 
you know, how many talks have you heard about seated meditation already? 832 probably. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but in traditional Buddhism, we have, have focus meditation, uh, which is the eighth step on the eightfold path, concentration meditation, where you might work with your breath or a mantra with your breath or counting your breath, something to focus you so you're not flooded. And then we have uh, uh, the seventh step in the Eightfold Path, which is mindfulness meditation or bare awareness. Now, I'm cheating a little in, 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 in using bare awareness for the seventh, but I, I, I'm, I get to cheat, you know, so, especially if I tell you I'm cheating. <laughs> anyway, bare awareness, uh, where we don't... Uh, focus on anything we're just open we just let everything pass through and and we just come back to just being here with it without walling off from it without hiding in a private part no one else has to see your private part but you're sitting there in the wall you see it just just let it come through just let it come through <clears throat> so that's the second type of meditation the third type uh is what Kadagiri Roshi used to call stupid zazen. So in stupid zazen, you don't do concentration meditation, <laughs> uh, focus meditation, or bear awareness. You just do stupid zazen. I'm not going to say what that is because if I do, you won't be stupid. You'll be you'll become less stupid, and I want you to be more stupid. <laughs> stupid zazen is just stupid zazen. Period. Anyway, that's the third one I talk about in my book. <clears throat> um, uh, then the last uh, portal I talk about is an immersion in nature. So those are the five portals. And if we can open through those portals, the hindrances, the five hindrances, bringing the aggregates into view, doing mantra work, doing seated meditation, being in nature, we're really stumbling toward enlightenment. And there's one other ingredient that I mentioned in my book, and that's the importance of the Rasanga as a rock tumbler. We never like our Sangha too well once we get to know our Sangha. There's something that rubs us wrong. Someone said something to us, someone annoyed us, someone isn't practicing wholeheartedly, and we get annoyed. And we want to go to another Sangha. And of course, back in those days, when I was a young man, I couldn't go to another sangha. But now we have 832 sanghas we can go to, so we can just go from one to another to another, and we think each one is just right for a while until it it's, it becomes abrasive. And then we think, oh, no, I need to go to another sangha. But this is the rock tumbler of, of the sangha, the rock tumbler. The rock gets smooth by just being with others, um, being, trying to listen to them, trying to get caught by their stuff, trying to lot, let your stuff project on their stuff, just by being with them, just by being with them, just by being with them. And the rocks get smooth. The rocks get smooth. So we used to have this phrase when I was a therapist, dysfunctional families. And we would say, oh, I saw a dysfunctional family today. Oh, and my friend would say, oh, I saw six dysfunctional families today. And I said, well, how many families did you see? And I, he said, six. And I said, well, I saw six, too. I said, well, why do we need the word dysfunction? They're families. They're families. Sanghas are families. And, and with a rock tumbler, we, we feel just wonderful camaraderie with our families, even though they annoy us sometimes. Even though we see their, you know, always see their weaknesses. So that's that's part of preparing ourselves for this wonderful accident, enlightenment. And this means we've got to allow ourselves to make mistakes. Instead of contract, contracting around what we know, we have to open up to what we don't know. I have, I'm doing Zen and brain science now in Minneapolis. 
instead of hardening our, our neurons harden around what we know due to aging and we get more and more like this but we have a chance to resume to our beginner's mind which is neuroplasticity softening the art the neurons as we so soften the neurons configuration we're already living more lightly we think we haven't had the accident of life we already have <laughs> It's already here. When you act more lightly and more joyfully with your friend and more empathically with your friend's suffering, that's enlightenment. What more do you need? You want some big woo-woo experience? Of course you do. Well, you might have a big woo-woo experience. That's cool. But then you want more of it. So I would say less, less, less. Simplify, 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 as the Roy said. And just come back to being between... Of course, between any two pines, there's a new way of life. Just be with those pine trees. There's a new way of life, a fresh way of life, a first time way of life. You don't have to get neuron fixated <laughs> as you get older and older and older. Maybe my posture is getting, my daughter's telling me my posture is getting worse. She says, Dad, you're going to have to do something about that. You're getting more and more stooped. She says, mom's not stupid, but you are. So just this last week, I got a whole routine trying to get my shoulders and neck react, <laughs> alert. But even this, it happens to my body. It doesn't need to happen to my mind. Through Zazen, through meditation, through any of these portals, you return to a wonderful freshness and joy at just being with each other. Just being with each other. <clears throat> So I say we can hold within kind awareness and curiosity our private parts and we become whole. And here's a quote I in my book. Each rejected aspect within our shadow carries within it the seed of wisdom. It's waiting to show us something important about ourselves. But this feels quite perilous as it requires us to see things we don't want to see, accept the unacceptable and embrace the deplorable. The wisdom of the shadow is about manifesting wholeness and balance, what Dogen called whole being Buddha nature. Then the last part of the book, let's see, it's 1010. Um, I think I can just I maybe have a couple minutes for the last part of the book. That's the uh, that's the part everybody's waiting for. And I'm going to say the least about it. Falling awake, falling awake. The harder we push, the more our neurons harden. That's why old people are so caught. You know, they're never in the present. They're always somewhere else. Except for old meditators like me and Dokai. We're just hanging out, having a good time, aren't we, Dokai? <laughs> um, so uh, what we can, we learn to release this hold. We learn to, let the, let the mind give up trying to figure it all out with its map. It's always carrying around this map of how things should be. So it's never enjoying the two pines because it's comparing them to all the other pines in the wood. Dogen calls this body and mind falling away. This sounds mystical, but it's just the dichotomy between body and mind. I want to control my body with my mind. I want my mind to behave. But when that dichotomy falls away, then, as Dogen says, we, we're enlightened by all life. We're enlightened by a pine tree or a ladybug or if someone's anger at us um, because we're just it's just what it is. It enlightens us. It tells us something about our interconnectedness, our lack of interconnectedness. And if there's a lack there, we just open up to it, breathe through it, and right through the anger we feel some wonderful interconnection. Suzuki Roshi calls this letting your anger uh, burn away like a big bonfire. And he, he used to say, I wish I could do that because he had anger issues. <gasps> you think a Zen teacher shouldn't have anger issues? Well, good luck. <laughs> good luck on Zen teachers. Just a human, you know, just a human. <laughs> anyway, I have got lots of stories about Suzuki and his anger, but I won't. But his anger had really, by the time I knew him, he was, he used to say, when I was young, I was like a tiger. 
Now I'm just like a pussy cat. And he was very much just like a, a cat. <laughs> just, 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 just able to be where he was. Although, one, although once in a while he would spring into action. <laughs> scared the, scared us a lot when he did that. That's the old times then. The teacher whacked you with a kiss after. He used to come up. Well, I, won't, I don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> So we to collapse, to collapse the dichotomy between suffering and joy. We collapse it. We let it collapse and fall into inner being, inner being, not inner being, but inner being. I call this dancing with Nagarjuna's tetralemma. I'm not going to talk about that tetralemma now because my book is it's in my book and I don't want to take time. And then we discover all these portals into boundless light, including the six. Uh, paramitas that we always try to practice. These are our practices we try to do so hard. And the first one is generosity. I'm not going to talk about the others, but I do in my book. Can we be generous to our stinginess? Why are we stingy? We're stingy because we're scared. So we're all that, oh, I got to be generous. I got to be more generous. These guys have already given to Hokyoji. How much can I give to Hokyoji? this campaign oh they'll, they'll find out if i don't you know we want to be generous but we're always measuring but real generosity means oh also being generous to our stinginess we're stingy because we're afraid other people are stingy because they're afraid because their amygdala has taken over that's a whole other other dharma talk and, and we can we, we can get that we can be generous that's that means that that the this, the stinginess becomes a portal into boundless light, enlightenment, boundless light. Dogen causes taking the backward step and turning your light inward. That's entering the unknown. So we can live with lightness and joy. And I think that's what I should say because it looks like it's 10 15 and. Um, I will, it looks like, I think Dokai said I got a little time for questions or comments. So happy to entertain questions or comments about anything. Happy to entertain questions and comments or stories and songs about anything. Who is that? Is that Carl? Hi, Carl. It is. Hi, Tim. Nice to see you here. Nice to see you. So I'm curious, uh, how would you define enlightenment? We talk about enlightenment all the time, yeah. but, you know, um, well, my, my I've never been quite sure as to see my what definition is being referred to. So, pardon? I was never quite sure exactly what was being referred well, to. Well, in Soto Zen, and and don't forget we're in Soto Zen here. I define it as uh, living more lightly, being able just to be present where you are and not be burdened by your thinking living more lightly so we can have a special experience of enlightenment and that's good where all of a sudden we open up and we're just nothing but but joy and sense of interconnection but it's the moment to moment living more lightly that comes out of our practice that is the real enlightenment uh you know dogan has his frame praise practice enlightenment where he says practice equals enlightenment enlightenment equals practice and then and he combines them into one word, practice enlightenment. Uh, and that's cool. I, I like that. Uh, but then we, then we think you should go to practice. But you don't need to practice. Just practice. You know, practice. No, practice. Right? <laughs> Always we're practicing. And if we're doing that without worrying so much about what we should be doing, what we have done, and what we might have done and what you could have done and should have done but just giving ourselves to this activity that we live lightly and that's my definition of enlightenment 
and you can quote me and you can you can develop a new, a new sutra about it, the living light the sutra if you want <laughs> i just finished teaching wei nang wei nang the sixth ancestor has the audacity to to say that his teaching is a sutra he's the only chinese and japanese teacher his platform sutra it's actually his disciple who had the audacity to do that. <laughs> so, but uh, all a sutra means is a sacred teaching that helps a sutra comes from the word suture in uh, in Indo-European languages. Stitching together, that's which has been rent asunder. And enlightenment is just stitching together that which has been rent asunder because of our worries and concerns and our feeling of not being okay. So that's my definition. <laughs> Other people. Since that's it came cool. up, uh, I, I, I've, I'm quite fond of the term practice enlightenment. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I have to say, in my earlier days, I, 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 I just could, I couldn't get it. I mean, I... Uh -huh. Why is it one word or something like that? But but these days I think of it more simply as, uh -huh. as just practice is like a verb and enlightenment is the, the subject. So I just practice enlightenment. Because you know? it's like I don't know what enlightenment is, but I'm just gonna practice whatever I what if that's I'm good. Gonna practice it. And that's so good. someone's looking, you know, talking to you and you're angry. And so I'm just going to practice. How do I, you know, right here, this is enlightenment. So I'm going to practice it. <laughs> That's right. That's oh. non-dual. Uh, thank you, Dokai. So the key feature of Mahayana Buddhism that dist distinguishes it from early Buddhism is its non-duality, meaning everything, all life is interpenetrating and that includes our anger the part we want to kick out our shooting and should nodding and non-dual means uh, if i if i take care of this fabric of my life by just being with it wholeheartedly uh, then i'm taking care of the whole fabric and the whole fabric supporting me so thank you dokai thank you So, Tim, this is Marilyn came in here. I want to thank you for your talk. Uh, marvelously thorough and complex, and I'll have to listen to the talk again and buy the book. <laughs> so hooray there. Um, and uh, a phrase that you used early on in your, your talk about, uh, I think it was practice ladder. I thought, oh, well, maybe that's what I've been doing. But I have a question for you. I think I know what your answer will be, but I, I can't resist asking. It might be a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> so we've got the five hindrances, the five aggregates, the six paramitas, the mantras, and blah, blah, blah. And then I think it was just practice or something, whatever you, whatever you mentioned. So I've been trying to listen very carefully. So how do I... Maybe this is a practice ladder issue for me. How do I, I mean, do I do it sequentially? Do I just grab one? Oh, I want a mant mantra today. Oh, I think I'll focus on the hindrance of anger today. What do you say to someone who's trying to figure it all out? And again, I want to thank you for just a well, great sure. talk. Well, sure. Well, the one I talk about the least to you guys and to all the talks and the, all the talks I've been giving is is meditation okay. and that's just that's the center one that's the center one and the and mantras and gatas can help us be more meditative and being in nature can help us be more meditative and uh, being more meditative can help us being when we're in nature can help us do a gata and a mantra with wholeheartedness but the mantras and gatas and nature, those are two of the portals, support the meditation portal. And then bringing the hindrances into view, that just means, I mean, it's you maybe would want to take a class with Dokai or someone on the hindrances, but you don't need to. 
one of the hindrances, for instance, is uh, doubt. And, you know, you just have them in front of you and you bring them into view, but you don't have to remember them in order. Whenever you have doubt, whenever you have stinginess, you just bring it into view. And the five aggregates, that is actually a practice that enhances meditation. But I wouldn't probably wouldn't do that on your own because it's kind of complicated uh, when you but it's taught uh, by the Theravadans and by me a lot. Uh, uh, so that's these are all so bringing the aggregates into view, the hindrances are both support to me- living more meditatively, more joyfully. Nature and um, the fourth one, uh, which uh, gathas and mantras are also support. So they support us just living more meditatively, more s- spaciously. And you don't need to do them sequentially, uh, but uh, you might just want to try a mantra, or you might want to remember that whatever hindrance comes in your mind during your meditation, you can just breathe with it and welcome it and not try to get rid of it. Uh, so those, those are using two ancillary supports. The third ancillary support, hang out at Hokioji, or just go to Lake Bede Makaska, or just go into your backyard. <laughs> just go into your backyard. Geez, the number of sparrows we have in our backyard. I, I just go into the, my backyard, and I see those sparrows, and a lot of people say, my son says, oh, they're just sparrows. What do you mean they're just sparrows? Wow, just look at one sparrow and everything is there. All the support I need for the whole rest of my life is in one sparrow. (laughs) So each of these are ancillary supports to living more meditatively, living in a a practice enlightenment kind of way, an enlightenment kind of way. Sounds like I have a roadmap that I'm going to rip up, but thank you. (laughs) Uh I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's just been delightful. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Well, happy to be here this morning. So I hope you guys all enjoy your day. I don't know uh, what you're going to be up to, but it is Sunday. So maybe you can get to hang out in nature today. (laughs) Between any two sparrows, there's a new way of life. (laughs) It is Father's Day. What? It is Father's Day. Oh, it's Father's Day. Yes, my son hasn't called me. I don't know if, oh, it's also my son's birthday. So, you know, I'm taking him out to lunch, but uh, he'll probably remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Wonderful to visit with you guys. Hope you have a good day. Hey, thank you, Tim. Uh, just a couple of closing comments. Uh, yeah, you can. <clears throat> um, first off, uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh on the uh, June 20th, Ajo uh, McMullen, I think he's probably given a talk at uh, MZMC as well in Clouds and Water, I saw. But anyway, his, uh, he's coming to Hokioji as well to talk about uh, um, what's intimately transmitted from uh, east to west. And it's one of the Zen uh, suttas that we uh, chant quite often. And originally that meant from India to, to the Orient, but now it, it, he's... Uh, saying what came from China and uh, uh, Japan to our to our country. I think that's what he's going to emphasize. And uh, and then for the first time, Barbara Fish Murphy is is uh, conducting a retreat from June 22nd to the 25th. And I, I don't quite know the structure of what she's doing, if it's just open to her students or everybody. But uh, if you have interest in attending that retreat, uh, you would need to contact her or Hokyoji, and we can figure that out for you. I'm not sure there's much going on at July in July on our calendar, um, but we do have a couple things in August as well. Uh, the Jewel Mirror Retreat, uh, the third week of August, and also a family weekend, the the weekend before that. So I'll close now um, with uh, the four. Four great vows. I have a makeshift bell here that I'll close with. It's just a glass and a spoon. So anyway, I'll leave, the, I'll leave us. Okay. Yes. Can I just interrupt to add yeah. some information? Mm-hmm. Fishes uh, is uh, a 
closed retreat. Okay. So, and um, in July, clouds and water will hold a retreat. That's right. That's right. That's all. Okay. Thank you. So I, I didn't know the nature of Fish's retreat. So yeah, it's not open to the to us, <laughs> I guess. Okay. We'll do the the vows now. Uh, beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. And the Buddha way is unsurpassable. And I vow to realize it. All right. Everyone have a great uh, Sunday weekend. And I uh, hope to see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you so much. You.